Good morning, everyone. This is Global Governance, a webinar series. Good day to each and every one. Good day to each and every one. the awareness on international relations and diplomacy in various activities, to which paved the way for the launching of the Global Governance Webinar Series. Since Since February 2021, we are already on our fourth episode, to which we were already able to tackle topics like U.S. and Philippines foreign relations with Professor Andrew Yeo of the Catholic University of America and public diplomacy of our very own public affairs counselor of the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, Norval Philip Roska. Today, we are beyond blessed and very excited to learn more on conflict and peace building and peace in border states together with our guest speaker, Professor Patrick McNamara of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, who is also one of the lecturers in the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Academic Fellowship Civic Engagement. Well, I guess, this seems like we are already attending the YCD Academic Fellowship with the lineup of our speakers that we have in CRC. I am James Lepore, and on behalf of CRC, I welcome you all to the fourth installation of the Global Governance Webinar Series. Stay tuned as we sail through this course. Thank you so much, Jose Marie Aslapour, the Branding and Communications Officer of Conflict Resolution Clinic. Indeed, it was a very beautiful day. Good day to the world as we are live, all parts of all in the world, especially in the Philippines. Before we proceed to our exciting discussion on this morning, let us have our favorite group photo op. This is our virtual photo op. So to those participants who is with us via Zoom, who can turn on their video cam, let's turn on our video cam and let's have our group photo. There you have it. So bear with me guys, because we are, I think, we are, I am going to have a screenshot of three pages. So this is three pages. So let's have, there you have it. Turn on your video cam. All right, so, so are you ready? Our first gesture for the day is our two thumbs up for peace. So if you can go onto your screen and do a two thumbs up for, for, for the peace, for peace, let's do it. Okay, page one, are you ready? This is our two thumbs up for the for peace. And to those who are tuning us live, you can do your selfie, by, uh, selfie live by your phone or your computer. We're excited to have your photos later on. For now, let's have, okay, four pages. First page for two thumbs up. Ready? One, two, three, smile. All right, page two. We've got the page two, two thumbs up. Are you ready, guys? There you have it. One, two, three, and two thumbs up. There you have it. And page three. Are you ready, page three? Ready, and one, two, three. And our last page.
page via Zoom. Are you ready? Let's get it. Let's get it. There you have it. One, two, three. All right. Thank you so much for having our first photo off. So we have this morning. It's very exciting. We have been preparing this morning for you guys. And without further ado, let me give you a little background of our speaker, our guest speaker live at Omaha, Nebraska. So he has worked with universities, corporations, governments, NGOs, and foundations for over 30 years. He consulted with more than 300 organizations and presented workshops around the world. To name a few, he go with in the US, Afghanistan, India, Israel, Morocco, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Switzerland, and United Kingdom. He teaches peace building, trains community and leaders in conflict management and negotiation skills. And he had done many international researches. To name one, he had his initiative entitled Balkans Bold Initiative. BIH on Omlandinsky Lideri, training in Bosnia and Herzegovina, young leaders in civic engagement, conflict transformation, and peaceful coexistence. He mediates conflicts at the interpersonal community, interpersonal community, organizational, and international levels. He has worked with the U.S. Department of Justice Community Relations Service, mediating community and school conflict. And he also serves or started a consult consulting firm resolving inter internal disputes in churches, synagogue, and mosques. He serves currently the Director of International Studies at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, where I had my academic fellowship on civic engagement last 2015. And previously, he served as Senior International Officer, Director of the Sustained Dialogue Initiative, and Facilitator of Omaha World Affairs Council. He was a 2011 Fulbright Narrow Senior Scholar in India, conducting research on water conflict, teaching social entrepreneurship, working at the, and working at the philanthropic consultancy. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy also did a TEDx Omaha talk on water conflict and water peace. Let us welcome our professor, our mentor, and one of my favorite person when it comes to conflict resolution and peace. We have Dr. Patrick McNamara. Unmute. There you have it. There I am. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Angelica, thank you so much for that introduction. I wish I could take you everywhere with me and you could do my introductions because it's like a, a, a I don't know, I felt like a Bollywood star or something when, <laughs> when you were introducing me. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of is the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. And Angelica is one of our star alumni. We actually have uh, another star alumni. I see Alan on the line. Alan, great to see you uh, when, when you, oh, there you are. Oh, beautiful. Oh, it just warms my heart to see you because actually you were, you, both of you were right here in this room uh, uh, with my family uh, <laughs> for a dinner when we had Shabbat dinner together. That was such a special time. Oh my, it's great, great, great to see you both. Um, I, I, I know it sounds a little bit strange for only having, you know, four weeks or, or uh, five weeks with you here in America, but I grew so close to you and my heart just goes out to you and all of the work that you're doing. I'm so proud of you. You, you, you. you really are doing just wonderful, wonderful stuff. 
And I appreciate both of you so much. There are probably other Wysili alumni on this uh, on this Zoom right now. Uh, maybe you didn't come to Omaha, but maybe you went somewhere else in the United States. Um, I love the Wysili program. And I hope uh, all of you, if you have not yet been a Wysili, uh, Wysili fellow, please, please think about applying for either the Wysili Academic Fellowship uh, which Alan and Angelica both came on, or the Wysili Professional Fellowship. Uh, if you're a little bit older and into like young professional, but please, please think about coming and um, experiencing this. Um, right now, let me start by saying it is such a difficult time, such a difficult time in the world, um, difficult here in the United States on many different levels. Uh, but I know the Philippines also, um, there are, are challenges and conflicts and all of you are doing really, really important work. So uh, thank you for, for, for the work that you're doing. The Conflict Resolution Clinic, if I, if I understand it, is really a training ground, a, 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 a platform um, experiencing to this. meet. Um, and uh, I, I really right now, appreciate the, the opportunity. Really uh, so Jose, you, you were giving a little bit of an introduction there and I appreciated, um, the, the energy and the, uh, the vision that you were uh, sharing. And I know, uh, Jara, you also have, um, some, some leadership role, I think in this, uh, in this endeavor. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing really important. Um, Shall I go on and uh, share my screen now? Shall I try to do it? Let's see. Um, if I could share. Uh, my topic today is conflict and peace building in border states. And this is something that I've thought a lot about and done some work uh, on peace building um, in this realm. So what I'm going to do is start with a brief centering exercise, and then I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, you've actually heard from uh, Angelica a lot of my, my bio, but I'm gonna give you a couple of highlights. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the University of Nebraska at Omaha, where I work, um, and where we've had the Wysili Fellowship since 2015. Uh, I have a, an opening question for reflection that I'd like you to think a little bit about, uh, which contextualizes our conversation in your particular communities. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this idea of border states and border communities and how that plays into conflict resolution. I'm going to talk a little more about the conflict resolution basics. And then I want you to come back to what you were thinking about in that opening question, applying the concept to your particular community context. Uh, I'll open up at the end for questions and answers. Um, actually, I'll, I'll take questions and answers throughout. So if anyone wants to send uh, questions, um, you can either, you know, raise your hand or uh, Angelica, if you could just watch for the, um, the question, you know, function and interrupt me at any time and just tell me, hey, Patrick, I've got a question for you. So sound good? Here we go. I always like to start with three deep breaths. So I know all of us are coming from busy lives. All of us are coming from work or school or family or community. And we need to center ourselves now in the here and now. So I would ask you to please take three long, deep breaths. Thank you for that. I hope that that brings us in a mindful presence to what we're about to enter into experiencing now. So just to say a word about me, I've, I've, I've spent, yeah, now over 22 years uh, doing consulting, 
Um, I've had a number of different jobs and then I've been a professor at six different universities. Uh, my background, my academic background is in comparative religions, East and West, uh, conflict resolution and public administration. Um, I could talk more about each one of those, but uh, uh, I'm just trying to give you a, a broad sense of, of my background. Now, talking about the University of Nebraska at Omaha, we have over 16,000 undergraduate and graduate students. We have uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD uh, level programs. Um, every year, actually, I should say this differently now, <laughs> Before COVID, every year we used to welcome 2,000 international students, scholars, and visitors from nearly 70 countries around the world to our campus. That included the Wysili Fellows that we've had. We are ranked uh, top or top 10 in many of the categories in terms of, uh, of US rankings. Um, I'm very proud to work at UNO, and uh, not only am I proud, but it's also a beautiful campus, as anyone who's been there knows. <laughs> now, I'd like you to think about your community. Who are the border states, or maybe who are the border communities that live next to your community? Is there conflict that exists between your community and those border states? What are the issues involved in those conflicts? Who are the parties to those conflicts? And what resolutions might be possible? Either have been tried in the past, or maybe you have a vision for some conflict resolution and peace building. We'll take just a minute and think about these questions, reflecting on these questions. I'm, I'm gonna do a little bit of presentation and then I'm gonna come back to these questions. So remember, or maybe even write down your answers to these questions. Who are the border states or border communities that are next to yours? Who are the us and the them? And there's different divides. Every community has different divides. Think about that. What are the issues? What are the parties? What are the resolutions? Hold your answers because we're going to come back to that later. Now, the topic of my presentation today is border states. And I'm broadening that to border communities. Sometimes it is actually a different country. Border states, different countries that are adjacent to one another. But sometimes it is border communities. There are groups that are living next to each other. There can be a number of different types of disputes. I'm only highlighting four here. The first is land disputes. I think of a place that I've spent a lot of time, India and Pakistan, and the land dispute over Kashmir. I think about disputes over fishing rights right there in your neighborhood in the South China Sea. And this is making international news these days. Think about your own community. In your community are land issues a source of conflict. Second category is political autonomy. Let's think about the issue of Tibet, 
China claims Tibet, but Tibet says we are an autonomous country. Here is an issue of people within another country, the Kachin people within Myanmar. They're actually one of the leading protest groups in the current conflict, but for years they've had a conflict against the Burmese uh, government and Burmese military. Think about your own community. Are there issues of autonomy? Does your community wish for more autonomy, wish for more control of decisions? A third category is resources. One of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is water conflict. And Angelica in the present, in the uh, uh, introduction mentioned that I've done a TED talk, Water Conflict, Water Peace. If you look that up, you can, you can see my TED talk, but this issue of resources, water is a huge issue between Israelis and Palestinians. The Jordan River is a major source of conflict there. Oil, oil as a resource was the source of conflict between Iraq and Kuwait in the early uh, 1991 uh, Iraq war. Economic inequalities might also be a resource issue. I ask you to think again about your own community. What are the resource issues in your community that divides people? Finally, identity conflicts. Whether that's race in America, ethnicity, Maybe I, I think about in, again, India, where I've spent a lot of time, the Hindu and Muslim divide. Are identity conflicts part of your own community? Do they divide in some way across religious lines, racial lines, ethnic lines, uh, class lines? There are all sorts of different divisions that identity can play a role in. So this is exploring some of those different disputes in border states or border communities. Now I'm moving from an analysis of the conflict to a possible conflict resolution tool. This is called multi-track diplomacy. Traditionally, diplomacy is thought of as track one, that is government to government relations. But in 1982, one of my mentors, Joe Montville, wrote an article in which he coined the term track two diplomacy. Track two diplomacy is what happens outside of track one, the government to government relations. And he lumped that all into one track two. But later, actually other mentors, I was very lucky, uh, Dr. Louise Diamond and Ambassador John McDonald came up with nine tracks. They called it multi-track diplomacy. And I actually had the honor of working with them at the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy in Washington, DC. They delineated nine tracks, and I'm going to briefly talk about these. They said that this is peace building in a holistic way, not just track one, government to government relations, but they would say track two, professional conflict resolution. Those of us who have gone into conflict resolution as a field, uh, uh, who are professionals and do this work as mediators around the world. Uh, track three, they said, was business to business relations. This is particularly interesting to me because I think that there is evidence that when two countries have tie-ups together, business tie-ups, joint ventures together, they are much less likely to go to war. 
at one time, at one time, this was called the McDonald, uh, the McDonald's uh, uh, phenomenon. The McDonald's phenomenon was that two countries who have McDonald's in them have never gone to war against each other. Uh, I, 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 I don't know if that holds true anymore. I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying that when countries have economic tie-ups together, they are much less likely to go to war, uh, to, to, to conflict with one another because their economic uh, standing is, is at stake there. Track four is private citizens. Many of us who have traveled know, even as a private citizen, you can be a peace builder. Track five is where I've t uh, actually put a lot of my energy um, in the past decade. That is in the education track, research, training. Uh, Wysili is actually a great, a great example of track five, peace building. I think that not only are we building bridges between the United States and ASEAN countries, but also even within ASEAN countries. I'm sure any of the uh, any of you who have participated in Wysili can say that you built relationships with the other Wysili fellows from those ASEAN countries as well. And I do think that that track five education training can be a very powerful way to bring people together across divides. Track six is activism. I think especially these days about climate change. And there's a lot of activism around climate change. Um, of course, traditionally Greenpeace has been a, a activist organization, a transnational organization. Uh, track seven is religion. And um, there are many cross-border religious organizations, uh, certainly the Catholic Church being one of the largest. Uh, one of my, my good friends works for the Catholic Relief Service, CRS, which is doing some of the most important humanitarian work in communities around the world. Uh, disaster relief, conflict resolution, um, that, 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 that religious organization can be a, a, a great impact on, um, on local communities. Track eight is funding. Uh, funding is philanthropy, and you have both community philanthropy that is based in the community itself, but you also have many international organizations. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, many of us are actually anxious to see what's going to happen now that Bill and Melinda Gates are getting a divorce. Uh, what's going to happen with their philanthropy? It is the largest foundation in the world, and it is doing such important work, especially around public health issues. And in these times, in these times of coronavirus, uh, the Bill and Melinda the Gates Foundation is particularly important in um, both finding a cure and uh, getting that vaccine out to the world. And finally, track nine is the inner circle that connects all of those other tracks. It is public opinion and communication. Now, when, when John uh, McDonald and Louise Diamond first wrote their book, it was 1996. Um, and they didn't know about the internet at that point. But I would say today, social media is really that track nine, that connector, that communication hub that keeps all of these other tracks connected. So this is the model for multi-track diplomacy that I am suggesting is a particularly important one as we think about cross-border conflicts. Where does conflict come from? Well, there are different levels of conflict. International conflict, which most of us have, have read about or seen, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes impacts intergroup conflict. Sometimes that impacts interpersonal conflict, and sometimes that impacts intrapersonal or inner conflict. That goes the other direction as well. When we hold inner conflict within us, we project that out to the world around us, and interpersonal conflict is projected into our families, into our communities, into our workplace or school or organizations. 
Sometimes that escalates to intergroup conflict, and sometimes that escalates all the way to international conflict. So this levels of conflict and how they are connected is a particularly important way that border conflict can escalate or, or, or that a a actually inner conflict uh, uh, from a psychological point of view, inner conflict can get projected out into the world around us. How do you deal with conflict? Well, hopefully all of us have some tools for peace building in our lives. I'm going to suggest six briefly here. First, know thyself. Know what triggers you. There are things that all of us have that trigger our emotions. The more that you can be mindful of that, you can hopefully prevent being triggered. Second, consider your part in the conflict. I'm part of a international interfaith NGO called Initiatives of Change. And we have a saying, when you point your finger at someone else, three fingers are pointing back at you. What is my part in the conflict? Maybe it's only small. Maybe I have only 1% of responsibility for this conflict and the other person has 99%. Well, what can I do to change even that 1%? The third point is active listening. This is difficult for those of us who have judgments in our mind, judging other people. But how to listen to others without judgment, listening for understanding. My, my, one of my problems is that my mind is always going to what I'm going to say. Oh, 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 I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say this. But sometimes just sitting back and truly listening to the other person is a better peace building response. Fourth, sometimes you can't solve the issue yourself and you have to know who to go to. Maybe if it's your organization, it's a supervisor or HR or coworkers that can help you. Fifth is focusing on the issue and not the person. I think not personalizing it is particularly important as a peace building tool. And finally, sixth, cool down when you're feeling emotional. Can I wait to discuss this? Maybe it's taking a deep breath. Maybe it's taking a drink of water. Maybe it's asking the person, can we talk about this in 10 minutes? Can we talk about this tomorrow? I'm not ready yet. So those are some personal tools for peace building that I just wanna talk a little bit about. Now, I'm going back to where we started your reflections about your community. Applying some of these concepts, whether they're the personal tools that you use for peace building, or whether they're big picture analysis of your own conflict, I'm gonna ask you to either unmute yourself or just type into the chat box here, how do you analyze conflict between your community and the border states or border communities that you live next to? How could those be resolved 
And is there a role for these different tracks of peace building that I talked about in the multi-track diplomacy model? Angelica, do you want to uh, uh, either add something here or uh, uh, if there's anyone who wants to, to weigh in, please, come on. All right, guys, let's share our thoughts about our own community. So are anyone from our participants? Feel free, this is a space where you can share your thoughts. You may unmute yourself. You're allowed to unmute yourself. There you have it. Okay, do we have someone from... Or you may type in a chat box if you want to. So while they're contemplating and reflecting to those questions of yours, Professor. Yes. Let me share to you my thoughts. Okay, please so, do. Yes, please. My thoughts are on our community. There is, there is a diverse, we are in the very diverse community, especially in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there are different kinds of views, thoughts, ideas, and it affects um, the factors that affects those thoughts and ideas are the things that we believed in, the things that, that we have faith on. And usually for the Filipinos, we love sitting down. I mean, personally, I love sitting down and having conversation. And it was really a nice conversation, uh, nice first step of dialogue is to sit down when I, I also remember that one when you did that to us and that that three deep breath and then you're yeah. grounding yourself yeah so um have you uh have you had other experience that are similar in other countries or in the europe do they also start with sitting down and starting that dialogue you know understanding each other Yes, I think I think so. Um, I'm going to say that this is probably more prevalent in Asian cultures. Uh, I think of uh, South Asia in particular. Um, you wouldn't get right into a negotiation. You would first have chai. Uh, you would have tea uh, with the person, and you know, talk about your family, and maybe talk about the community, and maybe build a relationship, a little bit of a, a time, and maybe even in that first meeting, you wouldn't necessarily talk about business so much. Uh, but in America, I think we'd be much more kind of direct and 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 be like, oh, you know, let's right get get right down to it. We want to start negotiating right away. No, 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 no. In India. Uh, I, I remember the first time I was, uh, it actually wasn't the first time I was in India, but uh, one time when I was in India, um, a vice chancellor of a university invited me to have a cup of uh, tea with him. And I refused because I was, I was thinking that uh, uh, I was late for my train and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it and I was nervous and whatever, whatever. And so, and, and, and I remember thinking afterwards, I, I, I made the biggest mistake of my life by saying no to a cup of chai. Always in India, maybe other places, you never say no to a cup of tea. <laughs> I love a uh, cup of tea. So Miss Jara will also share her thoughts. Yeah, so um, it reminds me of um, with our neighbor, Malaysia. So yeah. I, I am not going to propose a solution. It's a it's a very long-standing issue, right. but it reminds me of issue of Zaba. And I think the diplomatic track for this is as a private citizen. So it brings me back into this one time that I was sitting with friends, and they're not academic friends or in one way or another. They're just casual friends, friends of another, and we were we were having some drinks in the streets of of Bangkok. And we were in the same table, we were with some uh, Malaysians. And out of nowhere, the conversation about Saba came up and they and people started um, accusing one another about stealing Saba, who steal what, and this and that. 
But I guess, um, as you mentioned, Professor, you mentioned about this as a private citizen at Cha. I believe this is one way of putting ourselves aback of our political um, political motives, of our, um, say, our nationalism. We sat down there as a friend to to another, you know, uh, to your neighbor, like literally your neighbor because they're... Um, they're staying in um, they're staying in Bangkok for work, and I was there for 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 leisure. And we, in a very casual and not um, formal uh, setup, we were able to talk about what does a Malaysian see in uh, in the issue of, of issue of Saba. In the Philippines, we see it otherwise, and it was very enlightening to know that. They perceive the issue of of territorial issue of Saba in a light that perhaps the same way. So how do we resolve something if both of you have the same claims? So we, uh, as Filipinos, yeah, you mentioned you're correct, uh, Professor. It's it's hard for Asians, especially for Filipinos, because we're very, they said we're nice negotiators. We don't sit down and open up things. We need to start by yeah, like what uh, what like what you mentioned. We need to start with chai for mm-hmm. I think for Indians, yeah. for Filipinos, um, for Filipinos. If we if we do field um, uh, field audit, field interviews in um, in rural Philippines, you need to start by you wait for the farmers or for the laborers to stop working at like 5 p.m. and sat down with them and drink rum with them. <laughs> Um, dev workers actually I was telling this to everyone that we uh, we met for the first time especially if we are briefing them for for um, how to negotiate with or work, talk to people in the in the rurals mm-hmm. um, we sat down with them without uh, without judgment and I think they have trained us in more casual and informal way because they can open up and say things in in a more personal level yeah Thank you, Jar, so thank much, you for, for that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the story uh, uh, about especially the the rural urban divide, because we see that in the United States. We see that everywhere, actually, uh, uh, in so many countries, that urban rural divide. So uh, uh, thank you, especially for highlighting that um, that tension that can sometimes exist. But if you actually you, in your story, you said you have to wait for you know the laborers to come back from the labors and then you know maybe drink rum together or you know have some whatever the the drink is maybe it's tea maybe it's rum i don't know but uh uh you know whatever that 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 bonding issue um in in the christian tradition uh we talk about breaking bread together uh, because the the communion, the Eucharist, is an, an idea of, of breaking bread. Uh, and I remember my my mentor, Ambassador John McDonald, once said to me, "If you ever have a chance to break bread with another person, take it." He said, "Whether it is a chapati with the poor man in the village, or whether it is." a a, uh, Maharaja in the palace, always, always take the chance to break bread together. We make peace over food and drink. Yes, definitely. We have the voice from live from Mindanao. Hi, Alan. Can you connect? Oh, all right. Um, Alan? Oh, I can't unmute. Let me check that one. There you go. Hi. Hello. <laughs> all right. So, hello. Good evening. Uh, good evening for for Nebraska and good morning for the Philippines. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a big segue though. Anyways, um, whenever we talk about conflict management, it always makes me remind of Zamboanga City, Siege last 2013. So um, I think the, the, 
the big issue in Zamboanga City is really about the identity crisis. You know, it is being surrounded by um, people from different religion as well. Mentioned by Christians, Muslims, and Dumads, and um, cultural understanding is being resolved by um, different trainings, like what what uh, Dr. Patrick had made mentioned, training research. Um, that that will empower people to understand people um, people's culture and how they, they 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 do practice religions because sometimes you know um, what we thought about um, something that is very negative to others like to other religion it's something that is very normal to them and the best way to to resolve that issue is try to understand them. So uh, I believe um, that's just a very glimpse of Zamboanga City, but um, I hope uh, other delegates from Zamboanga City here could also share their opinion about uh, the conflicts um, in the borders of Zambasulta. Yes, so do we have a volunteer from Alan? Okay. Um, All right. I cannot unmute myself again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone from, from Zamboanga City would also want to share? Um, you know, I, I know you have something in you, uh, especially in 2013 Zamboanga City siege. Um, it was uh, the Philippines, uh, the Zamboanga City was really in the limelight that time. Um, yeah. anyone this was international to news. We all, all read about this. I know. Leora. Um, let me know if you can unmute yourself because you might try to unmute yourself, but you can't um, do that one. Can I, uh, can, I, can I take a minute and introduce my 17-year-old daughter? Hi. This is Leora. Hi. Hi, Leora. You're grown up now. I know. Yeah. She was a little girl when you saw her first. I, I actually just turned in my last assignment in high school tonight, so... Just graduated high yeah. school. Just, just graduated. finished high school. Congratulations. Yay. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm so proud of you. And tell 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 my friends in the Philippines, what, what are you doing next year? So next year I'm going to London to go to Trinity Laban School for Contemporary or uh, la, la, Trinity Laban Conservatoire for music and dance. And I'm gonna um, major in contemporary dance. So, wow, yeah. that was yeah. amazing. Yeah. I'm so Thank proud you. of her. Thank you. Well, Me and, too. And can I can I can I just say one thing about about this uh relevant for our conversation today? I think yeah. that many times those of us in conflict resolution talk about, you know, talking, talking, talking as a way to build peace. But actually, maybe dance is the better way to build peace. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it okay? Or maybe music, her... maybe peace through music is the yeah. better way. Any thoughts about that from our little girl? She's not little anymore. Oh, oh. She's turning six. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I peace agree. Through dance. I think dance and music. How that I... one? Actually, it's applicable now because more than ever because of all the stuff that's in the media right now. But I, for like two years, 2018 and 2019, I went to a dance camp in um, Israel. And so there were all these people from all around the world and from different places in Israel. And it was a very peaceful coexistence when we were all dancing together. And right and now with the Israelis and Palestinians exactly. in conflict, they need Maybe just dance. Maybe dance. dance. Maybe go make them dance. It is not that that simple but no 
no, no. But... <laughs> yeah, Camp, camps like that are, are one of the inspiration of conflict resolution clinic are camps as well. If we haven't had uh, the pandemic, we definitely had more interaction because we do know that when we meet and experience exactly the experience of how it feels like to be in your community and share that to others, we get to start to open our mind and, oh, this is how it works. And maybe we can figure out how we can do this together. That's why we really give some importance on experience. And that what that's what we're trying to do as much as possible. Give the participants our, even if it's via online, the experience of getting a glimpse of our community. You know, yeah. especially on the conflicts that we had and how we can start building these. So thank you so much, sweetheart. We will definitely going to be tuning in for your journey. Keep us posted. Definitely. Okay. Bye. I, Bye. I, I wonder, Al, Alan, I, I wonder if you or someone else from uh, Zambanga, Zambanga City can talk about um, what are some of the ways that you make peace? What are some of the peace practices that you do in your community? Uh, David, do you want to say something? Uh, can can they right. mute themselves? Um, anyone from Zamboanga City would like to answer that question? Let me know, guys, if you can unmute yourself. I'm on standby. <laughs> Or Alan can do the spoke per spoke person. So while we're waiting for their um, thoughts to give to Alan, we are now going to Q and A after this one. Tune in for your questions. You may raise your hand to personally send your question or send it via chat. We will have an exchange of. Of question Q and A with our um, with our speaker for this afternoon, so you can um, go around um, the challenges that you are experiencing. Anyone and wants to speak? If there's none, I want to share. All right, go, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Zamboanga City, you know, um, Dr. Patrick, you in one of our classes, you um, also. Um, lectured us with different uh, modes for conflict resolution. And those are uh, the negotiations, mediation, arbitration. And, you know, the last resort for conflict resolution is the, the conflict itself or the violence. It is where people um, resort their issues to armed conflict. And unfortunately, um, Zamboanga City um, once experienced that. Um, we have um, we've, we've been penetrated for the longest time since Kabatangan siege, Zamboanga city siege uh, for twice already. And sometimes whenever people um, cannot trace their voice to the government, uh, what they do is they resort their, their issue to, to violence. But um, at the other side of this uh, of this um, problem is that um, even if people, um, resort to conflict or to violence itself, um, what the government do is to, to give people or to, 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 um, to give the people the chance to, to, for, for negotiation. That, that's actually what happened in Zamboanga City. Um, because of different siege or different um, unfortunate occurrence in Zamboanga City or elsewhere in Mindanao, um, government is giving the chance for our um, Muslim brothers and sisters to, to raise their voice. And this paved the way to the Bangsamoro uh, law or the WL. Um, so um, unfortunately, this is how people uh, try to resort, uh, resort their issues. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's like still effective, though. <laughs> Yeah, can I just say one one thing about that? And and it is that when people don't have other tools, then violence is their only tool. Yes. And I think that that it's incumbent on you and actually every every single person on this line uh, to teach the 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 different tools for peace building so that violence is not the only tool in the toolbox. 
Yes, definitely, Professor and Ellen. Thank you for sharing that thoughts. We have one from King Erlano. So right now we're also opening the Q&A as well. We are now Good. an ongoing conversation. So you may go proceed to your questions and thoughts, mix it together because all of this leads to peace building. Yes, King. Hi, good day to everyone. I just like to share some uh, best practices that we have in Sambuanga. Um, my, I'm a member of JC Regatta and one of our um, members in uh, JCI, uh, one local chapter in Sambuanga. The JCI Sambuanga is launching, is having this project to provide for com conflict uh, resolution. They're actually providing uh, seaweed farming uh, livelihood to um, to rebels in a way to 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 bring uh to to provide peace in the area so actually a lot since they have uh, the last time i visited in 2017 in sabwanga uh, i think there were around more than 100 of rebels who have turned them in uh, because of that project mm -hmm. so i think it's something um uh, good that we should also employ in our communities to provide economic opportunities to individuals uh, so that um, conflicts can be resolved. This is such an important point, King. Thank you for making this. And I wanna go back to that uh, uh, track three, business to business. Um, I think that, that jobs are the number one way to fight conflict. If people have good jobs, if people have living wage, if people have dignity when they go to work and a paycheck to bring home from work, then very, very few would go down this road of extremism, would you know, take the ideology that uh, leads to terrorism. I think jobs are the number one way to fight terrorism in the world. And I hope that the example you gave with the rebels and seaweed farming, maybe this is a way to provide jobs and to provide dignity and to provide a small amount of money to support the families. It's such a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Ms. Jara. So, Professor, so if jobs is the answer or one of the tools to, to resolve conflict, um, in some in some situation or circumstances, let me cite Sambales, for example, um, jobs or livelihood is also the reason why there is conflict. So in in Zambales, if the, because we have participants from Zambales, there are some yeah. students in the in the room. Yeah. Yes. So would, anyone who wants to share, because I know you know more information than I am. But in Zambales, um, their considered municipal waters is still a part, is, is now a contested area. So it's a it has become a conflict, not just because of its huge national sovereignty issue, but because fishermen are displaced. And their yeah. livelihood is strongly affected by, by the territorial dispute in in the in a, in the place where exactly their parents or the fishermen are getting um, their food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, do I hear a sound from um, our partner university, President Ramon Magsaysay State University? Yes, keep going. Um, you can unmute yourself. Yes, Christine. Is that... okay. All right. Um, excuse me. Am I yes. loud and clear? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, the, the picture may not show it, but yeah, I'm a student from President Ramon Magsaysay State University. Um, yes. Yeah. What the previous speaker said is true. The local fishermen and um, fishing industry has been in constant conflict with the Chinese Coast Guard and the Chinese fishing and the Chinese um, fishing militia or whatever it's called. Um, and it, it has been a serious strain on the livelihoods of the um, 
on the locals, especially in the area known as Masinlok, uh, which is closest to the contested um, waters. And it has been a um, massive issue in, in regards to what the government response should be in the locals in the local sector. Um, yeah, that, that would be all. I just wanted to um, support her um, argument. Um. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Uh, Cecilia, yes, Cecilia goes on. Thank you for, uh, for, for that statement. So professor, with, with that situation that we're facing, one of, one of, the, of, of the challenges that we're, we're facing on, on that one, um, how, as a, as a citizen, how we, can, how we can begin to, you know, it's very important to at first have an understanding within the citizen so that we will be able to know how to respond, how to respond with the situation that we are facing. Are these also have similar um, similar challenges from other other border states or borders that we, yeah. we have and other? Yes, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tread into uh, into uh, dangerous waters here, but I do think that the South China Sea and the the Chinese uh, uh, you just called it the fishing militia. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese fishing ships that are encroaching on territorial waters of the Philippines and others um, is a major border conflict. Now, this is not just, just kind of land conflict or uh, it is a resource conflict in the sense of, of, of uh, the, the fishing, the, the fish, right? It's, that's a resource. But there's actually, I think, more at play here. It is a way, it's, it's also a symbolic way for China to exert its power in the region. And so there are ways in which this is, you know, it could be interpreted as just a simple, you know, economic conflict or fishing rights conflict, but it's also a state supported uh, endeavor. If, if China was not wanting the, uh, the fishermen to be fishing in these seas, it would not be allowed. So there is a, uh, a government backing for, for this initiative. And I think that it is raising the, the es it's escalating the conflict in the South China Sea. Now, I, I, I know it's complicated and uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the U.S. right now and the U.S. interests because Philippines and the U.S. have been traditional allies. Uh, it's a complicated al alliance. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's always been all, you know, nice and hunky-dory, but, <laughs> but it's also, uh, I think, traditionally, uh, there's been an alliance there. Um, now, you know, to some degree, uh, Duterte has, ha, ha, has uh, uh, backed away a little bit from the U.S. And I think especially during the Obama years. Now, Trump, uh, I think, was I, I, I am not a Trump supporter and I don't uh, really, you know, like a lot of the foreign policy. But I do think that the Trump administration was hard on some of the negotiations with China. And I think that there is a, a, a consensus in ASEAN uh, that, that, I mean, China, it's complicated because China is your near neighbor, right? So when you talk about border conflicts, uh, China obviously comes up in, in, in that. But uh, you also have a close relationship with the US. I think that actually, um, in some ways, the Waisili program is an example of this, uh, of this sort of strategic alliance between the U.S. and some of the ASEAN countries, and uh, at least one of the many, many reasons for that close alliance is as a hedge to China and some of the rise of China. Uh, now, I have I have a little bit complicated um, views about the rise of China. And I actually believe that the US would benefit more from taking a strategic partnership 
approach to China, as opposed to always wanting to uh, conflict with China. I think that the, the, that the conflictual stance is not actually the best strategically for the US to be engaging right now. I think that we need to look for things like, uh, I mean, human rights violations should be called out regardless. Uh, what's going on in uh, uh, Xinjiang and uh, the Uyghur people, and uh, I mean the, the you know democ uh, democracy rights in in Hong Kong, and there are many things that need to be called out. But there are also times when China and the U.S. should be working closer together. Uh, China and ASEAN, China and the Philippines should be working close together when it benefits the Philippines. Uh, and 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 not just uh, you know exploiting the the relationship, but there are um, there are ways in which the U.S. and China should be working together uh, in in many parts of the world. Uh, and I actually it hurts me when we're always in conflict with China in this way. So uh, uh, that's a little complicated way to to to, to get into it. But um, I see John, John, you have your uh, your hand up there too, please. Um, January, you're mute. You can unmute yourself now. All right. Go ahead, John. Uh, good evening, Professor Patrick. Um, I, am, I am convinced that the first step in resolving a conflict is to determine the root cause. Um, you being on the grassroots level, what are your findings? And what do you think is the common root cause in every border state conflict? Wow. Uh... I, I am not sure that I can make a general statement about that. I think each conflict needs to be taken in its own unique way and analyzed in that own unique way. So I think it's hard for me to, to generalize. But something that you just said, which is uh, uh, sort of the grassroots of conflict, I think many times um, we're thinking about, you know, big picture, global strategy, geo strategy, and actually thinking and looking at the grassroots of conflict is really uh, uh, important to understanding the dynamics on the ground. Um, so uh, may, may, maybe I'm not answering your question directly, but I do think that that grassroots that you mentioned is particularly important. Um, um, yes, go ahead, John. Yeah. Uh, what do you, uh, talking about the grassroots level, what do you think is the importance of a bottom-up approach in resolving conflicts, a bottom-up approach? I'm sorry, what, what kind of approach was it? Um, a bottom-up approach, meaning- Bottom-up approach, yeah. yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Um, I do think that, uh, that you have to have both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. But I think many times um, we talk about uh, uh, the street or, or, or kind of what's happening on the ground level, at the grassroots level. Even if the, the top leaders of countries sign a treaty, sign some kind of peace agreement, that doesn't matter if the people on the ground, if the street is not committed to peace. Um, I'm gonna use a timely example right now. We are literally, literally seeing in the streets of Israel and Palestine, uh, the, the conflict erupting with street fighting between Arabs and Jews in, uh, in the streets of, of Jerusalem and, and elsewhere, right? So that street level, even if there is a government to government track one agreement, it doesn't matter if the other elements in the community are not coming together. So I think that, 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 that it's both top down and bottom up. You can't have one without the other. Okay. Uh, last question for the meantime. Uh, last night I watched William Urey's uh, video. Yeah, video. good. Uh, and I have this question um, regarding a 
next talk eh, that is in relation to your topic. What is the role of resolution and reconciliation when dealing with conflicts? Wow. Um, I do think that the role for uh, reconciliation is um, important when the time is ripe. So this is, this is going to be a little bit controversial, but I think that sometimes a conflict is not ready to be resolved. Uh, reconciliation is... Um, so that idea that you really need to have a ripe conflict, like like fruit that's ready to be picked. That's when the, the, the resolution comes, when that is ripe for resolution and not all conflicts are always ready to be resolved. Thank you so much, John. That was a very interactive, conversation you had with Professor Patrick. Professor, I have two questions from our unanimous participants. We got one from the live and one from here. Um, they asked, they, um, Professor, with the resources, there are different kinds of challenges in our resources. And you had done your sessions on, on conflict and water, which water is one of our important resources right now. What is your first step? tackling these issues when this uh, kind of challenge in water or water conflict begin or began or begins. Yeah, where I've seen the most um, success with regards to conflict resolution of water disputes is when the different water users get together and they prioritize and they decide processes for dispute resolution when they come up. Let me give you a concrete example. Here in Nebraska, we have what's called NRDs, Natural Resource Districts. The NRDs bring together the farmers, the industrialists, and the recreational users. And all of them together come up with a solution that's going to maybe not satisfy all of them 100%, but maybe I can get 80% and you can get 75% and you can get 60% of what you want. And by coming together, these different water users and saying, I need this for my agriculture. Well, I need this for my business industry. Well, I need this for my fishing whatever that is, right? Those different users come together and together they decide. <clears throat> this is going back to uh, John's point earlier. In some ways, it's a grassroots bottom up approach. It's not the government leaders telling the people, this is what you should do, but rather the people themselves deciding here's what we are going to do together. Here's what we're going to decide to do. And when those water user groups are the decision makers, rather than the top down government telling them what to do, that is almost always a better solution to water conflict. Professor, following up on that point, what if not everyone would join the conversation. What if somebody or some or some of the, the those people who are sharing the resources wouldn't want to sit down and have the conversation? Yeah, this is a very uh, difficult um, point that you're making there. And I don't know, uh, ultimately, I don't know what the answer is. Um, maybe there, there does have to be a top down uh, solution as well. Ultimately, if the users are not willing to come together and make some compromise, make some negotiations, then maybe there has to also be a top-down solution, the government to say, look, this is what needs to happen in this place. And the um, uh, enforcement mechanism to be able to enforce that decision when it's made. 
so this is again getting back to my answer to John, which was it's a both and. You do hopefully have bottom up solutions, but maybe when you need them, you also have top down solutions. Definitely the combination of those solutions are, are some kind of something that need to be worked out together. Yeah. For the last question, Professor, there are like some of the, a lot of questions I'm choosing a couple of ones. They are um, one of our participants in Facebook Live asked, with different kinds of players around uh, this uh, conversation when there's conflict sitting down there, how about what will happen? Uh, how can the how does the roles of from the citizen to the NGO can they just say that we want it to be we want it to be in conversation? Can we sit down? Can they just do that, or they have to be represented by an organization? Or um, does the their country or their representative or their their province would be the one who province leaders will be the one who will represent them, or can a regular citizen, a citizen of that specific community member of where the conflict is happening can sit down and have his or her voice? And yeah. the, the connected uh, one of that, on that question is mm -hmm. how, what if we are told not to sit down or we are told, oh, we will represent you, but um, you cannot personally be the one who will represent yourself and speak out your voice. So this is a, a, a really important question and one that I don't have a great answer to. I'm gonna answer it theoretically and then I'm gonna answer it uh, practically. On the theory, there are you know, two different kinds of democracy, uh, representative democracy and direct democracy. Representative democracy is when you uh, vote on people to represent you and your interests in some kind of a decision-making body. Where direct democracy, the people themselves get to decide what happens in their communities. Now I'm gonna go back to a example that I was using earlier. Um, the water user groups that can come together and through a direct democracy process, have a voice in the decision that most importantly impacts them. That is a very different, I would call it a bottom up direct democracy type of a solution where a, a representative democracy may have people that you send uh, to Manila to go represent you and you now have a, uh, a representative that's speaking for you, which may or may not be your actual uh, interests, right? So, 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 so now I have um, a top-down solution. My representative uh, in the capital city is going to make the decision for me and impose that decision on my community. Right. So again, this tension between direct democracy and representative democracy plays out in very practical ways in like a water conflict. Uh, so, 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 so that's my, my, my example there. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Professor, can we still uh, entertain more? I think two questions. There's an interesting one that pops up okay. and um, we have, she's going to personally ask you, um, you can unmute yourself. Where is she? Angela, call this out. Angela? Yes, Angela? Hi, am I audible? Yes, yes. you are. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, I think, a common question, especially for people my age, or at least the people that I know that I've had conversation with about the issue because of um, what happened with the siege in Zamboanga. I think it's, because we're so used to, um, sort. Of, I think at least that we we have this uh perspective in our minds that we're so used to violence, the people resorting to violence to sort of get their point across and and have some way of finding resolution for issues. And I think it's a common question for us. Um, how like how do we lessen the instance of people resorting to violence, or at least it's like, how do we eradicate that? How do we transition from 
from that manner of, of having a conversation with the government and the higher ups to having a more sort of healthy relationship with the government. Like it because I think it it really had a huge impact, like with how um, Muslims got more hate for their religion and and how activism sort of has a bad rep. I think that like with people my age um, wanting to be participative and active and raise their voice, it's sort of a scary thing to do because it's not, it's sort of taboo here, I think. So yeah, like how do we do that? How do we change that? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Angela, that, that's a great um, sort of cultural, uh, cultural context for like, li- li- like people not wanting to raise their voice and, and uh, uh, that, that, that sort of cultural tension uh, that gets played out there. Um, I think that there are at least two answers that I would give. First is going back to an earlier point. Um, the more tools that you have in your toolbox, the less that you're going to resort to just violence as your one tool. As uh, the saying goes, if all that you have is a hammer, then every problem is a nail. (laughs) Right? So, So if you give, Peep other people, if you give people other tools, then they're going to maybe not resort to violence as much. The second thing is about voice. If people feel like their voice is heard, and I'm, I'm, I'm now referring to some, uh, uh, some research. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the author. Anyway, the idea is that process satisfaction is actually more important than outcome satisfaction in the conflict process. By that, I mean that if people feel like the process is fair, if my voice has been heard, then even if I don't get exactly what I want out of this conflict, at least I feel some satisfaction because my voice was heard. Now, I think this is particularly important for people who are not uh, the elite, who are not kind of high on the hierarchy. People who are lower on the hierarchy uh, of society um, really want to have their voices heard. And so coming up with processes that include all voices, And I'm not talking now about sort of uh, uh, placating people and and, and pretending like their voice is being heard. Oh, 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 we heard you. Oh, we heard you. Oh, okay, you can shut up now. We heard you, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really, truly engaging with people on the issues that they think are most important. That is one of the most important things that you can do to de-escalate conflict and avoid some of the violence. Thank you so much, Professor. Definitely there are an interplay of of strategies of sitting down together. It's definitely one of the goal here is to have everybody start to have the conversation of sitting down together. Professor, speaking of sitting down, there are different kinds of ways in having that um, conversation. There are um, international ways, there are tribunals and stuff. One of the questions that we had here from one of the faculty of uh, one of our partner university in, in, um, in Prim Susan Ballas asked, what if the, the other party doesn't support or doesn't accept, um, for example, the tribunal decision that happens between um, the, the WPS of the Philippines and um, the China? So um, what, uh, what, how can we have this conversation? What do they want? Why they are not talking about where do you want to sit down or what kind of agency you wanted to be the way for us to sit down and speak? Does the other party or does China gives us 
because they said we wanted to sit down with you just tell us what agency or what where do you want to sit down so that you would accept the kind of negotiate or accept this kind of um, collaborative ways of dealing our conflict especially with it comes to resources management yeah. um I don't think that we always have good institutions to convene people. I, 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 unfortunately, there are there are very few neutral parties. Almost everyone has its their own interest in at play, right? So, in terms of uh, you know conflicts around. Um, you know, fishing rights uh, between the Philippines and China. Uh, that that's difficult because I don't think that there is just one commonly accepted institution that is going to always be trusted by all parties to come to the right you know solution. So, um, how you bring people to the table when they don't trust? the process is very difficult. I'm actually looking across my, uh, uh, my, my room right now and I'm grabbing a book. Um, so while professor grabbing his book. This is, uh, uh, this is the book that uh, actually I'm, I'm thinking of. Um, the, <laughs> It, it, it's the same. Uh, uh, I, I actually um, had a uh, a video by this guy, uh, Bill Bill Yuri, um, and it's called "Getting Past No." Uh, the 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 famous book that he co-wrote is called "Getting to Yes," and this was the follow-up book, "Getting Past No: Negotiating Your Way from Confrontation to Cooperation." And it's basically what if the 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 other party says no i don't i don't want to negotiate with you i don't want to sit down with you i have the more i have more power in this conflict and i don't want to lose my power right that idea of getting past no is particularly difficult um and each situation is a different a different solution there's not one size fits all but um but there are techniques that you can use to get past no with people who are trying to be obstructionist and just you know put a roadblock in every every piece possibility. Can there you are. give us, Professor, a one two three? Is there one two three like a summary of the of the strategies that William yeah. you taught? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. I think that the idea of uh, uh, bringing people together across um, lines of difference and sometimes having common experiences. And Bill Yuri in his TED talk talks about Abraham's path where literally Jews, Christians, and Muslims, all children of Abraham, walked together, like literally walked together along a path. And by having this common experience, Bill Yuri wrote, getting to peace. Getting to peace, transforming conflict at home, at work, and in the world. This book is sort of Bill Yuri's uh, wisdom uh, encapsulated, but one thing that he talks about is literally walking the path with one another. How we, again, break bread together. How we walk sometimes hand in hand with others is what makes the difference in our paths of peace. Thank you so much, Professor. All right, Jan, for last one, Jan. Uh, Go, Jan. Good evening, Sir Patrick. Uh, this is related to the multi-track diplomacy, particularly track one. So I understand that there's no one-size-fits-all solution, but is a multilateral approach possible 
to settle arbitrary case and what what might be the best or the most effective pathway to a um, sustainable peace building uh, I do think track one is very important and cannot be ignored. And I hope that my modeling multi-track diplomacy was not to say that track one government to government relations are not important. Um, I think that, that uh, uh, I don't know if ASEAN has enough power and neutrality um, I think that the uh, the situation in Myanmar, um, the the coup and the the uh, military crackdown of the protesters, um, I think that ASEAN has shown uh, that they have not been effective as a peacemaker in that particular conflict. Now Brunei, as the current chair of ASEAN. Uh, may not have the kind of boldness of, 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 of some of the other ASEAN chairs uh, that they might take a little more bold steps. But even then, I don't know that ASEAN is the right um, vehicle for peace building uh, with regards to, to that situation in Myanmar. Um, I, I, I wonder sometimes if the UN is a, a neutral body that could mediate some of these uh, South China Sea conflicts. Um, I think that the U.S. is probably not a neutral party. The U.S. has, you know, a, a, an interest in the conflict. Um, and so uh, when you think about the, the Chinese-Philippines uh, uh, conflicts, I, I don't know what the best institution is uh, in terms of track one government to government negotiations, uh, John, do you have any any answers to what you think the best track is? Um, unfortunately, with the um, growing public concern between China and the Philippines, we have seen that the United, um, the Philippines and China opted out of the um, United Nations provisions. Right. So right. we can say right. that the decision given by the United Nations is not legally binding. So that's the problem. And even with the existence of the uh, tribunal court or uh, in the Philippines is not legally binding and had not undergone a very tedious process. So I think that's it. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Professor. We had an enriching conversation with you and a very important out of everything that we have um, discussed on today's uh, webinar is that negotiating, uh, negotiating confrontation into collaboration. We definitely have to go towards that and find our way into collaboration. So we are hoping the best that on whatever conflict that we are facing around the world, we will be able to find a way to collaborate. Please open yourself to that conversation because it starts with those people who wanted to sit down and have this dialogue. Thank you so much, Professor, and to our participants who are with us via live and for your questions. If you have more, we definitely wanted to cater you all, but um, I think at this point, you want to take a pause, but we will receive your questions. Later on, we will collect them via email or via Facebook Live. We will check out some of the lives that we weren't able to, to check out. And if you have more questions, you can just go to our social media accounts via Facebook, Conflict Resolution Clinic 2020. Um, we also have our IG and Twitter, Instagram and Twitter at CRC underscore social. We have our websites, learnpeace.org and conflictresolutionclinic.org. And we have our email at conflictresolutionclinic2020 at gmail.com. So later on, we will post that as well with you. At this point, let's hear from the voice of our partner and here in Conflict Resolution Clinic. Clinic. She is an advocate of peace and human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from Ms. Jara Brillantes, the Conflict Solution Clinic project leader. 
thank you very much, Angelica. Thank you very much, um, Professor McNamara. So it's a great um, conversation today. I believe this is the most interactive that we got in the past few um, global governance series, right, Angelica? So yes. this is our effort to liberalize the access to conflict resolution, uh, conflict resolution and peace building. Um, for um, especially for friends in Zamboanga, we know that this kinds. But in conflict resolution clinic, we want this to be available to students, especially to those who are engaged in political science, international relations. So that we are all bonded in the common goal to. Go. So it's a great opportunity to be working with uh, different um, different organizations in this event, and I would like to thank our partner our partners here in Panay. We um, in CRC Lilo, which we were able to conduct last um, March. I'd like to acknowledge University of Antique um, and University of San Agustin. Um, we, uh, we, I would like to congratulate again University of San Agustin for winning CRC Lilo leg. And of course, see you soon, President Ramon Magsaysay State University in Zambales. Um, we'll have the same kind of energy or more for the regional clinic there. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the community leaders and youth leader partners from Zamboanga, um, um, JCI, and of course, JCI Iloilo and JCI uh, Zamboanga, yes. And of course, IOS, advocating youth towards outstanding sustainability. Um, of course, um, our YC League uh, associations throughout the country, the USJA hubs, USJA Samwanga, Tawi Tawi, and of course here in Panay and Guimaras. Um, thank you for Panay Hub, YC League Panay Hub for being, being active um, this year and of course in the years to come. And most especially to our international CRC project partner, University of um, um, Nebraska at Omaha, and of course, um, Professor McNamara, I've heard a lot from um, about you from Angelica, and I guess you were able to share your um, living room with us today. Um, thank you very much for always giving from last year till now. So I hope that, yeah, we can still push through. We are still hopeful that we can still push through the whole national uh, um, event here in the Philippines. And of of course, guys, let me just segue since there was a one significant question that was brought up earlier. How do we take part? How do we become a part of this um, conflict resolution or be a part of our effort to claim our sovereignty, especially in, 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 in areas in the Philippines where there is territorial dispute? In the next global governance series, we will have our specific speaker for that. So please um, um, join us again next time. And thank you very much again for coming in on your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Jaras, for that wonderful message of yours. And speaking of Conflict Resolution Clinic, I am going to share to you at this moment what happened because we already begun the implementation. And one also one of the exciting things that will happen, hopefully the pandemic will, will be, uh, will not gonna get worse as the months to come because Professor Patrick McNamara already committed to see us personally fly from the U.S. to here in the Philippines. So hopefully we can bridge that one and we will be able to have him in person. So at this point, let me share to you what happened, an idea of what's going on at CRC, a conflict resolution clinic. This one is the conflict resolution clinic who just concluded last um, April at Ilo Ilo. So this is Conflict Resolution Clinic Ilo Ilo. Let me share that one to you.
Mercury International. It's a network of over 30,000. They didn't spend a lot of time thinking about consequences to certain things. Student, I find it very, you know, engaging as well. I know more people my age and more people they follow the goal. For the world, always needs more diplomats. Hello, Mr. 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 Hello,
Thank you so much, University of Nebraska Omaha. This is a UNO at Omaha. UNO is the first university from the U.S. Omaha, Nebraska Omaha who become our official institution partner. So UNO will go with us on this journey, and of course, led by my from our professor Patrick McNamara. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us your weekend, and we are wishing a good. Good Shabbat dinner for you this evening there in Omaha. We're sending our regards to our brothers and sisters in faith. Thank you so much, everyone. I think that's it. But before that, let's have our last photo up with the peace sign. So if we're going to go thumbs up later on, we're going to do a peace sign right now. So turn on your video camera. There you go. And let's have page one. Are you ready? Show me your peace sign. You can also do it with your peace face. So whatever your peace face with your peace sign, you can do that one. Okay, are you ready? All right, we got, um, all right, Lazar, ready, ready? All right, one, two, three, peace sign and peace, and your peace face, ready? One, two, three. And one more, page two, peace sign. And the last one, page three, your peace sign and peace face. All right, thank you so much, everyone. This is Angelica Villarmino, your host for today. Not beating a Jew, but we will definitely see you. This is Conflict Resolution Clinic, and we will see you on the next Global Governance Series. <laughs>